Hi guys, I'm Dr. Joanne Michelle Martin of JMM Health Solutions. I'm a pelvic floor specialist um, working with pregnant and postpartum women. And today I have with me Andrea of Better Birth and in BIM. And for all of you who don't know, BIM is an abbreviated name for Barbados, which is the beautiful island that I come from. It's amazing. So if you haven't been, you have to go. Um, so I'll let Andrea introduce herself. Hi everyone. Hi Joanne. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a midwife and breastfeeding specialist. I, you can hear from my accent where I'm from, right? So I trained in the UK. Just um, talking today about how I trained in 1999 and we're in 2019, which is 20 years being a midwife, which is really awesome. Um, I moved to Barbados, how long ago? Seven, I said 12, 12 years ago, so in 2007. And um, I've been working here ever since, worked at the birthing center that was open, that was here, which is very much my familiar. My familiar is water birth, home birth, and um, very kind of gentle, empowered, woman-centered kind of care, compassionate care. Um, being a group practice midwife in the UK, that's how I started. And so I wanted to continue that in Barbados. So I came here in 2007, worked at the birthing center, had my first baby there, um, who is now nine years old, as a water birth. And that was wonderful. And had my second baby at home. And after, um, actually before he was born, the birthing center closed. So I was really anxious and nervous about how mothers and, and their partners can get some kind of options in Barbados because it was it's quite it was quite limited in terms of who you see and how you give birth and having access to more gentle care. Mm -hmm. So um, I decided when my son was two to open my own practice, which is called Rites of Passage Midwifery Care. And a little by a while after that, we set up the birthing and BIM as a charity. And that was really about advocacy, public awareness, um, and, you know, kind of promoting the kind of gentle birth care that we talk about all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and really, Better Birth and Beer has been growing from strength to strength to, to now to the point where we are going to be launching a new birthing center, hopefully within this Yay! 19. If not, then it'll be early 2020, um, but a non-profit birthing center, which is similar to one in Trinidad called Mama Toto, which is um, non-profit being that mothers who can afford do pay privately for their care and those who can't afford are subsidized so they get their care for free, which means then that, you know, lower income mamas who may be struggling a little bit still able to get, still able to get water birth yeah. and gentle birthing options. Um, so we're working towards that. Um, so that's really me in a, in a very, brief nutshell and and the charity better birthing and bim i think I'll, I'll give you a little bit more about the charity though we launched in 2014 and we're becoming non-profit actually so it'll be better birthing and bim inc rather than um, being a charity and really our focus is to promote support and actually then obviously provide services here in barbados that are much more woman-centered um, woman and family-centered um, gentle on the baby so reducing trauma we, we do hear a lot of stories about women having traumatic births mm -hmm. um and not having a very good time of it and um woman family center gentle on the baby and there's another couple of things that i usually say that have gone from my head sorry <laughs> but um really focusing on advocating for um you know em empowered experiences and knowing that and understanding that when you have a family that has started off their birthing and their family life in an empowered way, then they're much more likely to raise their children with confidence and in an empowered way. And then you have a healthy society because the family is a microcosm, isn't it, of, of the wider society. So when you mm -hmm. get the family right, then you can get the, you know, wider the community. Society. Exactly, the community right, yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Now, you know, I know we spoke a little bit even prior to, to recording this, but when we talk about, you know, I know here in the U.S., um, we've had a lot of information come out in the last year. We've had information stating that 
Um, you know, the U.S. Is, has one of the highest um, mortality rates for birthing moms. Um, we've heard that, you know, African Americans are 240, I think it was 248 percent more likely than Caucasians to die um, during childbirth. We've learned that I live in, in Georgia, um, and we've learned that Georgia has the highest uh, maternal mortality rate throughout the country. So all these, all these stats have been coming in, um, you know, in the last several months. And I think, but, but I feel like people still aren't aware. I feel like there's a lot that people still don't know. And that's just within birth in itself. Um, I mean, even for my niche specifically, working with the moms, either when they're pregnant, but definitely after pregnancy with a lot of the issues that they have, a lot of the, the things that society has defined as taboo that nobody wants to speak of, you know, whether it's incontinence, whether it's pelvic pain, whether it's, um, you know, issues with, with sex, whether it's um, PTSD from birth, which people don't realize is a real thing, yes. um, you know, and, and birthing trauma and all these other things that can occur. Um, I feel like there's still such a, a lack of knowledge. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you find um, within Barbados being a smaller island, a smaller community um, mm -hmm. as it relates to birthing? Well, much of what you have said uh, affects us um, as well in Barbados. Um, I think that because the difficulty we have here is that because a lot of it isn't um, public dialogue yet, it's not public discussion yet, whereas in the US there is focus on it, people are talking about it, you know, there are forums and panel discussions and all sorts of things going on that are focusing in, right? Mm -hmm. um, with here in Barbados and, and a lot in the Caribbean region, the focus isn't quite there yet. You get a few rumblings in the community, a few you know um, discussions here and there, organizations like ours trying to get the information out. But it's, um, yeah, th there isn't a lot of very public focus on it. And it being, we don't have, Actually, we have really good and improving mortality rates and morbidity rates for maternal and infant in Barbados, particularly, you know, pretty good. Um, the point we have, and obviously there's room for improvement, right? But I think a lot of the issue we have here is compassionate care. So there is an issue with the way that clients say they may be spoken to, they may be treated. Um, options not discussed or, or given um, and you know not much choices when it comes to um, how to have your baby the way you really feel you want to you know um, and, and that takes away from the dignity of childbearing so um, there's this kind of conundrum of on the one hand many families thinking well you know doctor knows best and you know you go to hospital because it's safe first and all the rest of it and then on the other hand and thinking well okay the treatment may not be so great so maybe we should just maybe we should you know just accept that that's how it is that's just what what you get when you go to hospital that's just how it you know um and then there's this in between of people that are more on the side of actually but why are we getting that kind of treatment? And why are they still doing things to us that are not evidence-based and why? And so Better Birthing and BIM has really been trying to focus on certain issues around that. Why is it um, acceptable to still receive non-evidence-based? For example, my, my bugbear is, is um, which I know it still happens in the US, is, is women being starved in labor and not being fed yeah. in labor even though the evidence tells us actually in many countries you know uk europe european countries are examples of you know women should be allowed to eat if they want to if they're low risk and they need to they should be allowed to mm -hmm. because it pose any additional risk um but we still are doing something that's actually you know causes detriment as far as i'm concerned to the mother and or her baby when in the birth process so people are starting to speak about it but there isn't enough momentum yet here a uh, better birthing didn't want to create that traction but there isn't enough momentum in the dialogue and then we also have this power um structure that probably goes back to colonial days where you know you don't really question too much people in authority and what the doctor says 
is gospel. Mm -hmm. um, very few people would maybe seek a second or third opinion. Um, and so they're more comfortable with the doctor making the decisions and then saying, okay, well, doc, you've said that that's how we should do it. So we'll do it. I'm fine with that. That if you go the other way and you say, well, actually, well, we've read and we've educated ourselves and we're really informed with research and we want this instead of that. It then means taking on responsibility, right? For your decision. Yeah. <clears throat> and not a lot of people, um, want to do that they prefer to leave the decisions decision making and with the doctor so um, even if it then means that they look back on their birth experience with dismay you know or feeling completely traumatized well maybe they have to go through that in order to come around the other side and think okay well maybe I should take more of my power back and find ways to you know um, so that's probably a bit of a long-winded um, response to your question, but you know we have similar issues in Barbados and in the Caribbean region, but um, different in terms of the, the how the spotlight shines almost on it. You know, yeah, yeah. completely understood. I think I think you touched on on something really important when you talked about compassionate care because. Uh, informed decision is huge and it happens here you know I, I think a lot of people think because we're in america that that the standards and everything is so much better um but we're still having a huge struggle um whether people opt for and and typically mostly in in the medicalized birthing situations being the hospital um we're typically finding that a lot of women aren't still given that voice or they're not heard or you know if they they have concerns those aren't addressed because for whatever reason um they're not listened to or their opinions aren't valued and things of that sort and I, and i think it's it's to the detriment of you know many of these facilities and to the moms because the the experience could be so much better but if you've got a mom there it's not to say that it's a, it's an emergent situation where you know this person is unconscious or something like that like in a very extreme situation medical situation and you have to make a critical decision mm -hmm. you know in, in most cases we're not even talking about high-risk moms exactly. and a lot of the evidence and a lot of the research has shown that you know if a mom is especially when she's not high risk there is no need for a lot of these invasive you know techniques a lot of these invasive procedures you know just let mom's body do what mom's body was designed to do um, you know, even recently they, they um, kind of revised the, the concept of full term. So any baby born before 37 weeks was considered, you know, between like 35 and 37 was considered just, you know, shy of full, full term, where, you know, whereas if they were born before that, they were premium. Now they're saying um, they really should be born between 39 and 41 weeks. Mm. But, you know, once upon a time, and, and I grew up hearing it's 40 to 42 weeks. Mm -hmm. And but you know here you know the day a woman turns forty weeks if that baby's not out doctors are like you need to come in we're inducing labor we're doing the C section we're doing this we're doing that and it's like but but why yeah. <laughs> you know there's nothing wrong with her you know she's not ailing baby is fine mom is fine just leave her and let her body do what it's supposed to do and we yeah. still haven't but we're still trying to mess with things that don't need to be messed with yeah yeah and then we have to rush in and rescue the mom and the baby you see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it is so much about women being empowered, couples being empowered, because once they kind of have an, a deeper understanding of some of the history in obstetrics and with midwifery, with, with midwifery care and, and the differences between the medical model and midwifery model and the fact that, you know, birth, pregnancy and birth is normal, is a normal physiological mm -hmm. process and less is more, you know, more you interfere the, the more problems you end up creating, do less, you know, especially if the mother's um, low risk. Um, once women and their, and their partners know this, then and they become more confident in their ability to tr choose for themselves, then they can, you know, um, choose differently. They can feel that, okay, well, yeah, even though doctor's saying this, I really am going to be pushing for that. And there's such a difference between having the confidence to do that and just saying well no i'm too scared to do anything else but just you know what has been asked of me mm -hmm. i recently had a client who said <clears throat> that she went in to see her doctor at um 30 
eight weeks or 39 weeks, she'd had a show, a mucus plug. She'd seen a mucus plug and um, the doctor asked her to come in and, and examine her. I don't know why. Examined her. And, you know, of course, the waters broke during the, the exam. exam. And so then that's great cause for having to induce, you know, stimulate contractions now. Um, and, you know, we all know that you've got a good 30, 40 percent increased risk of having to have a cesarean section when you're induced stimulated. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And she had a cesarean section at the end of all that. And to me, that was like, you know, so hard to, to, to not have the mother feel disempowered by her experience. Mm -hmm. but the fact is that the interference is really, you know, high, prob high prob probability that that interference caused, you know, this cascade of interventions that led to her having to have a very expensive cesarean section, major abdominal surgery. Um, and if she was um, more empowered or more confident, she may well have just said, well, you know, it's my mucus plug. I don't really need to be examined. So, you know, refuse the examination or really mm -hmm. ask why, why do you need to, you know, do an internal? But it's just as well, you know, doctors asked me to come and, and you know, I, we do have a lot of um, internals that happen um, on women in the last few weeks of their pregnancy. Mm -hmm. You know, no, no contractions, just, just, check, just checking, you know. <laughs> and it just implies that, you know, something could be wrong. Always that kind of air of mm -hmm. it's not normal. Things aren't quite normal. We have to make sure, you know. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all about empowering women, basically, you know, once they're confident and they know more, they can choose different. Yeah, that is so true. I mean, there are a lot of women that I've talked to that have had their membranes swept, um, unbeknownst to them, you know, because they go in and the doctor is like, well, I need to check you. Well, and, and the thing is, I don't understand why are you checking and what are you checking for? Checking. If the woman's not having contractions, what exactly are you checking? What, what are you checking for? Mm -hmm. and, and, but they, they still will say, well, I need to check you. And even in labor, when women go into the hospital, well, I need to check you. Well, what are you checking for? If you checked me an hour ago and I'm not feeling active contractions, they're still far apart. I'm not feeling the need to push. What are you checking for? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and I'm comfortable. There's no risk. And so we, there's still that, you know, from a medical standpoint, well, this overuse of intervention, this, this, you know, like you said, less is more, especially when it comes to childbirth. Um, but they're still trying to do too much. Mm. What, what about, um, cause you're also a lactation consultant, um, growing up in Barbados, I, I joke to a lot of people and I say, you know, cause my kids were breastfed for two years. And to me, that was normal. I remember, you know, just about everybody I know breastfed their kids. I remember people breastfeeding their kids, you know, beyond a year. It was quite normal. Um, I remember people breastfeeding their kids in public and did not feel a sense of, of shame or did not feel like they were being attacked for doing so, you know, because the community, the society understood, well, this is a normal process. Um, mm -hmm. Here in the U.S., not so much the same. <laughs> um, yeah. They're getting better. Um, they're getting better, um, but still a long way to go. What, what are your takes on, on, you know, educating women with regards to breastfeeding and, and how is that evolving within the community, especially for maybe younger women who aren't so aware, um, yeah. you know, and those types of things? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I, just to say I'm a lactation consultant in training. Okay. So I say breastfeeding specialist because I'm kind of still doing the, the course for um, IBCRC, which is quite in-depth and powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, moving towards that, I, I would say uh, breastfeeding in Barbados needs a lot of focus. You know, myself and um, uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Addison Bernard, we set up an organization, which is a charity as well, called Breastfeeding and Child Nutrition Foundation, um, simply because we could see that breastfeeding, you know, in Barbados needed a lot of focus. You know, we, we see that um, mostly, we did a stu we did a research study actually through University of West Indies and found that you know less than I think less than nineteen percent of women are actually exclusively breastfeeding um, for more than six months. Wow. To the six month mark, I should say, um, and you know it's very low, very low, um, and we have 
we do certainly have issues with some of the lower income mamas who tend to um, go towards a formula more. So the higher, end, higher income mothers tend to breastfeed more. Uh, obviously they've educated themselves in a certain way and really kind of go towards breastfeeding or seek help if, if they need help for their problems. Um, so breastfeeding needs a lot of focus. The, the good thing about it in Barbados is like you said, in a community, most of the time, it's not an issue to see a mother breastfeeding at a bus stop, walking through the aisles of a supermarket. I remember when I was, when I had my little ones, um, and if my baby would cry, they would say, oh, get the baby out and breastfeed the baby. Mm -hmm. Come on, don't let the baby cry, you know? Um, so there's not so much of an issue with breastfeeding in public. It's not this shame thing that you get in other places like the US. Um, but we, you know, and also to say that recently the main hospital here, which is Queen Elizabeth Hospital, um, became baby friendly through UNICEF. So UNICEF designated baby friendly hospital. They used to have designation back in the 90s, I think two different occasions, but they lost it because you have to keep it up every two years. Mm -hmm. um, but they're designated again baby friendly, which is awesome, you know, because it means then that we can have this proper more thorough focus because most women do have their babies at QEH you know mm -hmm. um, so if you don't have a good breastfeeding uh, foundation and, and network that starts off where these women are having their babies then you know you've kind of failed before you've even started so um, with baby friendly as you know there's a focus on the 10 steps there's, there's skin to skin contact at birth um, whether the baby's born by cesarean or vaginally um, and there's all these you know steps along the way to ensure that breastfeeding is you know, very much you know um, supported for the community for women um, so we're getting there in Barbados in terms of changing the landscape a little bit but um, we can see how the uh, more westernized American culture and that kind of thing has seeped in and you know there's this issue of people worrying about their breasts getting saggy and you know all the aesthetic stuff to do with um, breastfeeding so we try to increase public awareness as much as possible uh, obviously about the benefits but you know I, we you know we've focused on it quite a lot and we don't think it's so much people not knowing the benefits people do know the benefits of breastfeeding when you ask you know, they know the immune system is boosted for the baby. They know that mother has all these other benefits as well. Um, a lot of it is, you know, culturally, especially with the low income mothers, culturally, if they're single parent, daddy is one obviously who is, um, daddy is the one who would be buying the nappies, the pampers and milk, you know, and giving financially. And so that's his job, right? And so, um, or his role, I should say. Um, so there is this kind of customary expectation that partner is going to provide in that way. And so sometimes breastfeeding takes a back seat because daddy's you know, making sure that, you know, or they're looking to daddy to provide the, um, the, the, the milk, you know. Um, so there's other issues that we have here that kind of have a negative impact on breastfeeding. <clears throat> but it is changing and the focus is really to um, just kind of bring back the normalcy then you know normalize it like it used to be like you were saying you know breastfeeding for extended period extended um, times and um, making sure that there isn't any any taboo any feelings of you know and i think probably the main thing is support as well joanne support is so key because there wasn't a lot of community support for breastfeeding now there is more we have a group that we run um and there are other a couple of other groups as well and there's whatsapp groups and things so there's more of you can reach out to this group you can speak to that person you know there's more of a, a network of support and as you know that's so key Mm -hmm. because you have sure. one small issue which is maybe a painful latch because baby's just not quite got it right or you haven't got it right and that could end breastfeeding in like a week so if you've got support hey presto you know how to deal with your issue and it's all fine but mm -hmm. if you don't have it 
you stop breastfeeding, right? You know, so um, yeah, we we breastfeeding is doing pretty good, um, and and we have a long way to go though, a long mm-hmm. way to. Go. Now, after after women are having babies, um, mm-hmm. I know in the medical model here, it's typical to follow up six weeks after. Um, I think six weeks is nuts, personally, because you know because somehow most people have arbitrarily assumed that most women are finished bleeding by that time. Um, Loki is finished. Um, and there are some women who may be done with that by two weeks. Um, mm-hmm. It varies from person to person. But that being said, you know my contention is we you're pregnant. You go to all these visits once a month until you hit about 30 or 32 weeks. Then you go every other week and then you go every week. You know, it starts to increase in frequency. And this is over a period of nine months. All of a sudden the baby is born and now you only need to see this woman one time. This woman that has gone through so much. Now you only need to see her one time. And so there's not a lot of care and support um, in the traditional medical model for moms like it is in the midwifery model because I know oftentimes midwives will see moms more. So yeah, tell me yeah. a little bit about what your standard is as far as when moms have their babies, follow-up care, things of that sort, um, yeah. you know, especially in educating them about life beyond childbirth, things to expect, um, you know, the healing process because healing is so key. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as you know, change in the UK, midwifery model is quite strong. And so our um, familiar was that we would see the mother. Actually, there were some midwives in the community, community midwives, who only did postnatal checkups. They didn't do any birthing stuff, no antenatal, just postnatal visits in the community, seeing mothers. Um, and so that was my, um, that was what I was exposed to. That's how I was trained, that you saw the woman, you know, at least two to three times in that first week um, of her being home. And then um, often in the second week, you may only have to see her once, maybe more than that, depending on what she needed. So when I came to Barbados and I realized that the women weren't really getting postnatal checkups, um, they would in a public system if they're vulnerable women, but the women who generally are, you know, not necessarily um, high risk women or anything, wouldn't really get a postnatal checkup because the, the staff, the staffing levels for the polyclinics, you know, for the midwife staffing levels are so low that the midwives just couldn't get a chance to get out to these women. Um, and then if they're seeing a private doctor, the woman here in Barbados, then she's not really getting a postnatal checkup. She may get something, um, by the nurse at the doctor's office mm-hmm. or she might not depending on who what the doctor does you know oftentimes they call if they've got a problem otherwise they're not seen to like you said less like, it's four to six weeks mm-hmm. and it's way too long because especially for things like breastfeeding once a mother has kind of once she's passed that first week or, or so a week to 10 days and she hasn't had some support particularly breastfeeding and she's having problems she's got a very high likelihood of just introducing formula you know um and not not only the 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 feeding but just the transition that a mother makes you know from like you said having this baby inside of her she's growing she doesn't have to do that much baby's doing you know it's growing inside and now she's her whole life is turned upside down inside out topsy-turvy with this sweet blessed little baby that is pretty much controlling the household <laughs> to mm-hmm. bring in a sense of um, routine whenever that is, late, much later down. Um, and it is very stressful and we don't give onus to that at all to, 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 to parents. They cannot really prepare for that until they are in it and they are in it. And we have to, it's on us to really do a whole lot more because that transition part is um is very tender very special and then the healing is what the mother has to do physically um so i think we do a massive disservice to women in terms of um um how much we see them my my clients and better birthing and bim clients for the birthing center when it's open will be the usual midwifery model of care so within the first week we see them at least you know twice if not three times and then you know the following week whenever they need to be seen, if they need to be seen once or twice. Um, and we keep them on for four to six weeks. If they need a visit, we arrange it, you know. Um, but 
the importance of that particular time uh, is almost kind of lost, you know. And even in the UK where they have good postnatal care, you know, I, they, used to, kind of, they used to nickname it the Cinderella service because it didn't use, it didn't get, you know, considering how important it was, mm -hmm. new baby, new mummy, new you know, family coming, becoming, and didn't get good staffing levels on the postnatal ward and, you know, it wasn't, um, it was all always overlooked. Um, but like you said, mothers, they're, they're pregnant, we, get all, we give them all that focus and care. And then when the baby's out, when they really need the input, we're kind of distant, you know. So there's a lot of work to be done, though, in maternity care, isn't there? Yeah, there really is. There really, really is. You know, and, and a lot of it is about empowering. Mm -hmm. Because when you're seeing the woman at home or when you're seeing her in her environment, you're empowering her to know this is normal. This is what I should expect. This is proper healing. This is okay. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know. Um, I've had a couple of stories where I've seen mothers. I've done childbirth preparation classes and, and I usually talk about what to expect in terms of bleeding and um, how the lochia decreases and what to look for, what signs are that you know um, things aren't right mm -hmm. and i've had stories of women saying to me that they heard of somebody being at home bleeding passing clots bad smell and they didn't act on it because they didn't really think they didn't understand they didn't know that that was you know a serious problem and for a woman to be at home and to be in that situation where she's bleeding more than she was before and the smell has a, the blood has a bad smell and she's passing clots and she's having pain and all of that and she doesn't know that she should act on it that's to me testimony that we need to do a whole lot more you know yeah. and how we inform our mothers and the support we give at home absolutely mm. I, I think i think there's so much like you said there's so much to touch on i mean and, and i think like we've only really gotten to the tip of the iceberg in terms of helping moms and enable to you know being enabled to to empower them and educate them within communities, within, you know, just, just society, just so that they are aware, you know, even like you said, uh, the stories are endless from breastfeeding stories to moms who've had babies and they're like, I don't, I don't know what this is. You know, I've got moms, I've got moms who have pain and they're like, well, they just told me I had a baby and I'm supposed to hurt. So I just assumed this was normal. I'm like, no. <laughs> Why would you assume that, you know, or I've had, I've had moms that told me, you know, well, my mother leaked and my grandmother leaked and, you know, everybody said you, you're going to wet yourself after you have a baby. It's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. So I just assumed, yeah. I'm like, no, yeah. you know, but it's like this misconception in society that people continue to, to recite generation after generation and people are getting the wrong information. And, you know, so we really got to got a lot of work to put in, but I'm so thankful to have met you so thankful that we've had the opportunity to have this conversation. We still need to have many, many more, yes. but so thankful that we've at least gotten to start to discuss some of these things and for people to be aware. So yeah. tell me for those listening, where would people find you? Tell them, tell them where to find, um, better birth and in BIM, where to contact you, all that stuff. Right, so we are, as you know, um, on Facebook. So we have a page and a group. Uh, Better Birthing and BIM in the community is the page, and the group, which is an open group, you, um, client, um, persons can just, you know, want to ask to be added. And there's lots of very valuable information we share on the group. Mm -hmm. And then there's Instagram. We're on Instagram just as Better Birthing and BIM. And then by email, we are betterbirthingandbim at gmail.com. And then our website is about to be launched. We're just working on it. So that's coming hopefully in the next one to two months, just finishing mm -hmm. up a few last bits. And there'll be lots of updates on the website, you know, in terms of what we're doing and that kind of thing. And very soon we're going to be offering more services because a lot of a lot of what we've been doing, we're kind of laying some foundation work, you know, mm -hmm. on how now launch into the birthing center but before the birthing center is up and running services preconception wellness because we know how important it is that 
yeah. couples are healthy before they get pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. they know about um, to, how to increase their, their wellness before pregnancy and prenatal care, fertility um, and um, women's reproductive health issues, all these, you know, um, all these um, services we'll be offering through Better Birthing and been very soon this year. Um, so yes, reach out to us by email and also our phone number, which is 245-5355. So 246-245-5355. Okay. Awesome. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I'll have all that information posted um, along with this video. So anybody who is in Barbados, the wider Caribbean, or anybody who's just interested Um, please feel free to contact Andrea. She is a wealth of knowledge um, and really doing a great role to help others in the community. So please, please, please feel free to reach out to her. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye-bye.